Today we're going to talk about debts of gratitude, um, how to recognize them, how to respect them. This is a uh, this is a go show that Nietzsche wrote from uh, again from his exile on the Izu Peninsula. Uh, specifically, it was written to a gentleman that. Uh, had defended him, had converted to Nichiren Shonen's uh, teachings of Buddhism, uh, as most did at the time, uh, from Nembutsu. So, I say that um, to add a dimension of understanding that the people who converted to Nichiren's teachings were probably faced with a great many uh, hardships, just from the norm of people, uh, not unlike today, uh, if you're different than the uh, congregations and the belief systems that are around you, you're looked up on as either an outsider, or if you used to be one of them and converted, a traitor, uh, and that shows up in the marketplace and in other places where you meet other people in your community, right? So Nietzsche was always very thankful for his followers, while at the same time uh, congratulating them on making the right choice. <laughs> so, but I guess that's the human condition, right? right? We all need validation. And we all need to know we're doing the right thing. As much as we make our own decisions, um, we never want to feel like we're taken for granted, right? Well, certainly in the case of this gentleman, um, during the, uh, trying to remember what persecution it was, the, uh, the, something, the Komatsubara persecution, in 1264, uh, Yoshitaka sent offerings to him and continued to maintain pure, uh, resolute mind. He was killed defending Nichiren Shonen at the time of the Komatsubara persecution in 1264. So, uh, this letter, or this gosho, he wrote to Kudo Sakon no Jo Yoshitaka, known as Kudo Yoshitaka, the lord of the Amatsu uh, in Awa province. Uh, this was uh, on the Izu Peninsula. So, uh, this letter was written to him, obviously, before he was killed defending the, the uh, Nitrin, but... Um, it's still, it's about debts of gratitude. This is prior to his dying in defense of the shonen. Uh, but obviously they had a strong relationship that not only converted this lord of that area, but um, was a strong enough bond that he felt he had to protect Nietzsche and did, do, did so at the cost of his own life. Um, so once again, though, this was written before he lost his life. Nonetheless, a strong bond. The Four Debts of Gratitude. Concerning my present exile, there are two important matters that I must mention. One is that I feel immense joy. The reason is that this world is called the Saha world. Saha meaning endurance. This is why the Buddha is also called one who can endure. In the Saha world, there are one billion Mount Sumerus, one billion suns and moons, and one billion groups of four continents. 
Pay attention here because this is a commonly used device throughout all of the Buddhist scholarship. There's conversation about the moon and the stars and the sands of the Ganges and and Mount Sumero as though it's a one singular thing, right? We're we're familiar with reading that. But notice he's saying there are billions of them. So once in a, again, I need to remind you as you study Buddhism, Nichiren and any other sutra, that this is hyperbole. This is hyperbole to indicate that all of these grand ideas that are shared, whether they're monolithic in, in the, their rhetoric or whether they're multiplied in an unfathomable number, is because all of this is about mental processes. It's about our mental prowess and understanding and insight. So the Mount Sumerus are the height of understanding of each of us mortal humans, each sentient being, actually. But So don't miss this point. When he says this, he's expanding the story to say, look, we all have our pinnacles, each of us individually, immeasurable, innumerable, right? You hear these words all the time in the titles of sutra, in, in the content of the stories, because respect is always given from the first day Shakyamuni Buddha started to teach. He understood that every single sentient mind would come to the same realization through their own network of thoughts, energies, attachments, desires, he respected that, so he taught that way, and Nietzsche's following suit. With its Mount Sumeru, sun and moon, and four continents, that the Buddha made his advent. So, what does that mean? The Buddha, the Buddha mind, the realization of this core truth, is fundamental to all minds, not just the mind of the Buddha. Buddha is not a singular thing. It's all of our potential. It's in all of us already. We need to reveal it. And we reveal it through climbing our own Mount Sumeru. <clears throat> Japan is a tiny island country situated in a remote corner of that world to the northeast of the country in which the Buddha appeared. Since all the lands in the ten directions, with the exception of this Saha world, are pure lands, their people, being gentle-hearted, neither abuse nor hate the worthies and sages. In contrast, this world is inhabited by people who were rejected from the pure lands in the ten directions. They have committed the ten evil acts or the five cardinal sins, slandered the worthies and sages, and have been unfilial to their fathers and mothers, or disrespectful to the monks. For these offenses they have fallen into the three evil paths, and only after dwelling there for countless kalpas were they reborn in this world, yet the residue of the evil karma formed in their previous existences has not yet been eradicated and they still tend to perpetrate the ten evil acts or the five cardinal sins to revile the worthies and sages and to be undutiful to their fathers and mothers or irreverent toward the monks. So, he's talking about behavior here, right? For these reasons, when the thus come one Shakyamuni made his advent in the world, some people offered him food into which they had mixed poison. Others tried to harm him by means of swords and staves, mad elephants, lions, fierce bulls, or savage dogs. You can read these stories in the sutra. Still others charged him with violating women, <laughs> condemned him as a man of lowly status, or accused him of killing. Again, some, when they encountered him, covered their eyes to avoid seeing him, and others closed their doors and shuttered their windows. Still others reported to the kings and ministers that they held erroneous views and was given to slandering exalted personages. These incidents are described in the Great Collection Sutra, the Nirvana Sutra, and other teachings. 
the Buddha, was innocent of all such evil deeds, yet in this world is peculiar or deficient in that those with bad karma are born into it and inhabit it in great numbers. Moreover, the devil king of the sixth heaven, scheming to prevent the people from this world from leaving it for the pure lands, seizes every opportunity to carry out his perverse acts. So again, we're not talking about other mystical places. These are states of mind. So people are deluded. As common mortals, we are. This human beings are deluded by what? Our greed, our anger, our our our, our delusions, our, our attachments to thingness, so on and so forth. And there are many forces at work that take advantage of that. Look, think about propaganda. Think about marketing. Think about uh, capitalism in the way that it uh, it it. it uh, has a complete model of greed and, and reapportionment. And anyway, we can go on and on, right? It appears that his scheming is ultimately intended to prevent the Buddha from expounding the Lotus Sutra. The reason is that the nature of this devil king is to rejoice at those who create the karma of the three evil paths and to grieve at those who form the karma of the three good paths. So... Think of our government right now in the United States. Think of how they delight in stoking the fires of violence and racism and inequality. They're laughing. They're saying, this works so good. Don't give them too much credit, though. It's not that they know exactly what they're doing in the grander picture of enlightenment or the, way, the future of humanity, so on and so forth. They're just driven by their own greed. Their ignorance is that they don't understand the greater picture and what they're actually playing with. They're just delighting in it. Yet he does not lament so greatly over those for, uh, who from form the karma of the three good paths, but he sorrows indeed at those who aspire to the three vehicles. Again, he may not sorrow so much over those who seek to attain the three vehicles, but he grieves bitterly at those who form the karma to become Buddhas and avails himself of every opportunity to obstruct them. So the three vehicles, learning, realization, Buddhahood, or Bodhisattva and Buddhahood, right? The three vehicles being uh, the tandem learning and re realization that people of uh, incorrigible disbelief, people who live in their minds, the Pratyaka Buddhas, the Arhats, those people, that's still a very noble path, even though it's not the ultimate path. Um, he doesn't, the, the evil karma, the king, as he says here, this personage, as he's saying, for this karmic reality, uh, doesn't, is perturbed by it, but doesn't spend too much attention on it. Whereas uh, those looking to become Buddhas, those are direct confrontation. Those, those he tries to attack and stop cold. He knows that those who hear even a single sentence or phrase of the Lotus Sutra will attain Buddhahood without fail, and exceedingly distressed by this, contrives various plots and restrains and persecutes believers in an attempt to make them abandon their resolute mind of conviction. Although the age in which the Buddha lived was certainly a defiled one, the five impurities had only just begun to manifest themselves. In addition, the devil stood in awe of the Buddha's powers. Yet, even in a time when the people's greed, anger, foolishness, and false views were still not rampant, a group of Brahmins of the Bamboo Staff School killed the venerable Madhagalyayana, who was known as the foremost in transcendental powers and King Ajatuhatru, by releasing a mad elephant, threatened the life of the only one in all the threefold world who was worthy of honor. Devadatta killed the nun Utpalavarna, who had attained the state of Arhat, and the venerable Kokalika spread evil rumors about Shariputra who was renowned as the foremost in wisdom. How much worse things became in the world as the five impurities steadily increased, and now, in the latter age, hatred, 
jealousy toward those who believe even slightly in the Lotus Sutra will be all the more terrible. Thus the Lotus Sutra states, Since hatred and jealousy toward this sutra abound even when the dust come one is in the world, how much more will this be so after his passing? When I read this passage for the first time, I did not think that the situation would be as bad as, as it predicts. Now I am struck by the unfailing accuracy of the Buddha's words, especially in light of the present circumstances. His exile, for instance. I, Nichiren, do not observe the precepts with my body. Nor is my heart free from the three poisons. But since I believe in this Lotus Sutra myself, and also enable others to form a relationship with it, I had thought that perhaps society would treat me rather gently. Probably because the world has entered into the latter age, even monks who have wives and children have followers, as do priests who eat fish and fowl. I have neither wife nor children, nor do I eat fish or fowl. I have been blamed merely for trying to propagate the Lotus Sutra. Though I have neither wife nor child, I am known throughout the country as a monk who transgresses the code of conduct. And though I have never killed even a single ant or mole cricket, my bad reputation has spread throughout the realm. This may well resemble the situation of Shakyamuni Buddha, who was slandered by a multitude of non-Buddhists during his lifetime. It seems that solely because my resolute mind of conviction in the Lotus Sutra accords slightly more with its teaching than does the resolute mind of conviction of others, evil demons must have possessed their bodies and by causing them to feel hatred toward me. I am nothing but a lowly and ignorant monk without precepts. Yet, when I think that such a person should be mentioned in the Lotus Sutra, which was expounded more than 2,000 years ago, and that the Buddha prophesied that that person would encounter persecution, I could not possibly express my joy. He sees himself identified in the teachings. Another validation that the teachings are just right on point. It's not self-aggrandizing, understand. It is already 24 or 25 years since I began studying Buddhism. Yet I have believed wholeheartedly in the Lotus Sutra only for the past six or seven years. Moreover, although I had resolute mind in the Sutra, because I was negligent and because of my studies and the interruptions of mundane affairs, each day I would recite only a single scroll, a chapter, or the title. Now, however, for a period of more than 240 days, from the twelfth day of the fifth month of the last year to the sixteenth day of the first month of this year, I think I have practiced the Lotus Sutra twenty-four hours a day and night. I say so because, having been exiled on the Lotus Sutra's account, I now read and practice it continuously, whether I am walking, standing, sitting, or lying down, for any born, anyone born human, what greater joy could there be? So I just want to interject here a point that somebody asked me recently, is it the only way to practice to sit in front of Gohanzan and chant to Gohanzan? Absolutely not. Nichiren's talking about it right here. What is important is to keep one's mind on the teachings, keep one's mind aware of the way all of our experience is going through these lenses of our various life conditions. And if we're constantly bringing our life condition back to the, the, the sutras and Buddhist teachings, then we have a much greater percentage of time spent understanding the depth of our thoughts and the way our mind works, and therefore elevating our life condition more consistently. So yeah, uh, this person asked, can you chant while you're driving your tractor around? Yes, of course, I often do. I chant to myself, I'll chant out loud on a tractor's loud. I'll be out there on the fields using the tractor and Namu myo renge kyo, nice and loud, blah, 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 blah. You know, um, trying to keep my mind 
focused on its highest potential understanding of life and appreciation of, for life. But to sit in front of Gohonzon concertedly in attention with respect, sitting properly, breathing normally with a steady rhythm and the Gohonzon as a perfect mirror for our Buddha mind and Buddha state is a precious opportunity of deeply focused concentration where tremendous insights will just flood your mind. Um, certainly I've had insights out on the tractor too. Um, it's just not as easy to connect with our Buddha mind in that situation, but certainly, certainly works. So here it is, Nietzsche talking about this very thing. It is the way of ordinary people that even though they spur themselves on to arouse the aspiration for enlightenment and wish for happiness in life, they exert themselves no more than one or two out of all the hours of the day. <laughs> That's a lot for most, right? And this is only after reminding themselves to do so. As for myself, I read the Lotus Sutra without having to remember to and practice it even when I do not read its words aloud. During the course, and this is what he means by resolute mind and conviction, a resolute mind stays attached if there's an attachment to be made. And because we're human, that's our healthiest mechanism in life, attachment. Uh, but if you attach your, your mind to do the perfect jewel, as opposed to the detritus of life, won't your mind be in a better place? Won't you be more capable of understanding things more sharply and broadly and clearly. This is an analogy of my own now. During the course of countless kalpas while transmigrating through the six paths and the four forms of birth, I may at times, at times have risen in revolt, committed theft, or broken into others' homes at night, and on account of these offenses have been convicted by the ruler and condemned to exile or death. Wow, what a stunning admission, right? This time, however, it is because I am so firmly resolved to propagate the Lotus Sutra that people with evil karma have brought false charges against me, hence my exile. Surely this will work in my favor in future lifetimes. In this latter age, there cannot be anyone else who upholds the Lotus Sutra 24 hours a day and night without making a deliberate effort to do so. There is one other thing for which I am most grateful. While transmigrating, which we all do through all the ten worlds, right? Study the ten worlds. We're constantly moving through those life conditions. While transmigrating in the six paths for the duration of countless kalpas, I have encountered a number of sovereigns and become their favorite minister or regent. If so, I must have been granted fiefs and accorded treasures and stipends. Never once, however, did I encounter a sovereign in those in whose country the Lotus Sutra had spread, so that I could hear its name, practice it, and, on that very account, be slandered by other people and have the ruler send me into exile. The Lotus Sutra states, quote, As for this Lotus Sutra, throughout immeasurable numbers of lands, one cannot even hear its name, much less be able to see it, accept it, and embrace, read, and recite it. Thus those people who slandered me and the ruler, who had me banished, are the very persons to whom I owe the most profound debt of gratitude. One who studies the teachings of Buddhism must not fail to repay the four debts of gratitude. According to the contemplation on the Mind Ground Sutra, the first of the four debts is that owed to all living beings. Were it not for them, one would, not find, it one would find it impossible to make the vow to save innumerable living beings. Moreover, but for the evil people who persecute bodhisattvas, how could those bodhisattvas increase their merit? So everyone has an opportunity to practice the bodhisattva path and attain full enlightenment, right? The second of the four debts is that owed to one's father and mother. To be born into the sixth path, one must have parents. If one is born into the family of a murderer, a thief, a violator of the rules of proper conduct, or a slanderer of the law, then even though one may not commit these offenses oneself, one in effect forms the same karma as those who do. 
So I, I'm going to read that sentence differently. We don't. We are formed from the same karma. Okay. As for my parents in this lifetime, however, they did not only gave me birth, but made me a believer in the Lotus Sutra. That thus I owe my present father and mother a debt far greater than I would have had I been born in the family of a Brahma, Chakra, one of the four heavenly kings or a wheel turning king, and so inherited the threefold world or the four continents and been revered by the four kinds of believers in the worlds of human and heavenly beings. In other words, he would have been well satisfied had he been born into privilege and may not have continued to learn about the lotus. The third is the death owed to one's sovereign. It is thanks to one's sovereign that one can warm one's body in the three kinds of heavenly light and sustain one's life with the five kinds of grain that grow on earth. Moreover, in this lifetime, I've taken resolute mind in the Lotus Sutra and encountered a ruler who will enable me to free myself in my present existence from the sufferings of birth and death. Thus, how can I dwell on the insignificant harm that he has done me and overlook my debt to him? Now, that's an interesting perspective, isn't it? So I've gotten several questions on Cora.com lately about what do you, how do you deal with uh, somebody who's trying to rob you or hurt you or an evil person? Um, here you have Nietzsche talking about, well, this, this evil ruler who exiled me is actually giving me great opportunity to focus on my enlightenment, on the Lotus Sutra, on my practice, on my study. I need, I, he's given me a gift, even though he doesn't understand that. My debt of gratitude to him is the opportunity he's afforded me to delve more, and the inspiration, in fact, to delve more deeply in my study. Interesting, right? The fourth is the debt owed to the three treasures. When the thus come one Shakyamuni was engaged in bodhisattva practices for countless kalpas, he gathered all of the good fortune and virtue he had gained thereby, divided it into 64 parts, and took on the merit, their merit. Of the 64, he reserved only one part for himself, the remaining 63 parts he left behind in this world, making a vow as follows. There will be an age when the five impurities will become rampant, erroneous teachings will flourish, and slanderers will fill the land. At that time, because the innumerable benevolent guardian deities will be unable to taste the flavor of the law, their majesty and strength will diminish. The sun and moon will lose their brightness, the heavenly dragons will not send down rain, and the earthly deities will decrease in the fertility of the soil. The roots and stalks, branches, leaves, flowers, fruit, lose their medicinal properties as well as the seven flavors. Even those who became kings because they had observed the ten good precepts in previous lifetimes will grow in greed, anger, and foolishness. The, the people will cease to be dutiful to their parents, and the six kinds of relatives will fall into disaccord. At such a time, my disciples will consist of unlearned people without precepts. For this reason, even though they shave their heads, they will be forsaken by the tutelary deities and left without any means of subsistence. It is in order to sustain these monks and nuns that I now leave the 63 parts behind. And, uh, with that, I'm going to stop here because I'm running out of time. Uh, we'll be able to finish this in one more video. Um, strong messaging here about how to view our lives in the light of others and how people help us to achieve our enlightenment. Our debts of gratitude are not based on superficial things like money and gifts and possessions. They're based on deep understanding of our life forces themselves and how to live life well. Always remember that that's the goal. Talk to you again soon. We'll continue and we'll finish this wonderful sutra or uh, go show. Thank you.